right. Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for organizing this very interesting workshop. I've certainly learned a lot. And it's pretty clear <laughs> lots of exciting things are happening in resurgence. So I want to do several things in this talk. First, I want to give you some motivation from physics. Most people here are mathematicians, but I want to at least convey some reason of why physicists are so excited and enthralled with ideas in the world of resurgence. And then the latter part of the talk, I want to report on some recent work and ongoing work with the video Kostin, which is much more mathematical flavor. So the physical motivation is actually extremely ambitious. And maybe the mathematicians don't realize just how ambitious this is. We're really looking for some non-perturbative definition of quantum field theory that, it that can address problems such as what's the difference between Minkowski quantum field theory and Euclidean quantum field theory. This is a very deep problem that people have thought about for a very long time. It's extremely difficult. It's especially extremely difficult if you start to think about quantum gravity. And resurgence re introduces some new ideas that can help us at least make new approaches. There's a very famous problem in field theory called the sign problem related to finite density quantum field theory. I would say it's one of the top 10 problems in theoretical physics. It, it has impact not just in particle physics, nuclear physics, atomic physics, condensed matter physics, but also in chemistry. And it's a complete roadblock. People have known this problem for a very long time and there's essentially no progress in 80 years. Another similar level problem is non-equilibrium physics to really consider real-time time evolution in non-equilibrium systems without using just first-order perturbation theory to do it using path integrals. This is also a really serious problem in many fields of physics and resurgence has some new ideas about how to even approach this, this problem. So I want to talk a little bit in my motivation about phase transitions which are related to both of those uh, questions. And the common thread which we've heard many times during the conference already is to make sense of the idea of analytic continuation of path integrals. So to be a little bit more precise, this is what physics gives us. This is the Feynman path integral. The amplitude for a quantum process is a sum of phases, e to the i and action. That's what it is. That's what the real world is. For certain cases, we can convert this to what we call a Euclidean path integral by some formal analytic continuation, usually called a Wick rotation. So for certain things like static thermodynamic processes, even in QCD, we can make this transformation to serious calculations and they agree with experiments. So it's an extremely successful program. And the reason it's done is because on this side, the problem makes a lot more sense mathematically. We have the Feynman-Katz formalism, we can do Monte Carlo, and we can actually calculate things. But this is the real world. There are certain problems where you can't make this transformation in the standard formal sense. And that's why people are excited about resurgence. We've already heard from Professor Konsevich that even in these finite dimensional exponential integrals, there's a lot of interesting mathematics and topology related to making these analytic continuations and rotations. And so it at least raises the idea that since even in the finite dimensional context, we need to think about complex complexification and analytic continuation. It certainly strongly motivates the idea of trying to think about doing the same thing for path integrals. Okay? It doesn't solve the problem, but it at least tells you that it's a good idea to take <coughs> this seriously. And th so this is the, the question that's driving most of what I'm doing. Can resurgence and some form of infinite dimensional picard lefschetz theory be used to solve these really big problems in quantum field theory. And a step along the way is to understand something about phase transitions. So here's a sort of motivating thought that one of the important things coming from the general set of ideas behind resurgence from Professor A. Carl is that different critical points or special points in a problem can actually be related to one another in quite surprising ways that people hadn't thought about before. 
And so forget about all the details of how to do Borel summation. Just the ideas in resurgence are important. They've actually raised ideas of things to calculate that physicists hadn't even thought about calculating before. So this picture is supposed to be some sort of representation of these different critical points interacting with one another. So let me be really specific. This is a major unsolved problem in physics. The quantum chromodynamic phase diagram is a function of temperature and baryon density. We have techniques for calculating at zero density and very high temperature, at zero density and very low temperature, at zero temperature and low density, and zero temperature and asymptotically high density. We know how to do those calculations to some order. But all the interesting physics lies in the middle. And what we don't know how to do in any reliable way is to calculate in this region, to study things like neutron stars from first principles and nuclear matter from first principles. And so can we actually use some of these ideas to take our asymptotic methods out here and bring them into this interesting physical regime. So those are the sorts of problems that physicists are interested in. And if resurgence can help us to solve any of those types of problems, then it's big news. Okay, so, so more precisely, can we make some sort of <coughs> mathematical, physical, and also computational sense of an expansion of a formal path integral into some sort of sum over saddles or thimbles? Remember that a thimble is some sort of infinite dimensional version of a steepest descent contour. So on a thimble, the imaginary part of this thing in the exponent should be constant, in which case you bring out a phase. And what you're left with, up to some Jacobian here, is a well-defined integral that you can calculate in any number of ways. You could do Monte Carlo, you could do other semi-classical techniques. So if you could understand how to do this decomposition, even approximately, not, a, not as an equality, but even approximately, this would give a new way to do calculations that at the moment we don't know how to do. So I've been kind of, um, this is sh shorthand of some partition function depending on some coupling, we'll call it h-bar, but actually in realistic theories it will depend on more than just one coupling. For example, we've already heard many examples during these this week, where there might be some another parameter, which I'll call it n. In a matrix model, it would be the size of the matrices. In a gauge theory, it might be the un of the gauge group. It might be the number of fermions in a theory. But typically, this partition function will depend on several parameters, not just one. And in phase transitions only occur, the n could also be the volume of a system, for example. Phase transitions technically only occur in infinite systems. But of course, we all know that's not quite right because we've all played with magnets, which are certainly not infinite. They're just very large, very large numbers of particles. So we're interested in probing this n to infinity limit, and we know we don't exactly have to go all the way to n to infinity, but we have to have some understanding of what happens when n becomes large. And we expect that phase transitions will happen in this limit, but we should be able to see them as we approach this limit somehow. And the interesting thing about, or an interesting thing about resurgence is that if we have some trans-series description in one phase, it will go through some weird metamorphosis and transmute into something very different looking in another phase. So can we understand how that happens and um, learn some physics from that transition? Now, there's something called Li Yang zeros, which I think uh, Ricardo mentioned in his talk. It's a very deep idea in physics, is that in a finite system, there is no such thing as a phase transition. But you can already see hints of a phase transition in a finite system by looking for zeros of the partition function. But in a finite system, those zeros will be off the real axis. If the axis is, say, temperature or coupling or whatever is controlling the transition, they'll be complex, but as you approach this so-called thermodynamic limit, these complex zeros will pinch the real axis at the location of the phase transitions. It's an extremely deep idea due to Li and Yang, and we'll see how that works in some cases. For the mathematicians, think of a partition function 
If you live in a Penelope world, think of it as a tau function or as a path integral or a partition function. If you're familiar with statistical mechanics, think of it as a partition function. Okay, so let me now run through a few examples and then I'll turn to the more mathematical stuff. So let's start with the Matthew equation. This is a quantum mechanical model. I can think of it as a quantum mechanical model, but of course you can think of it as a classical system. And I think everybody's familiar with the classical model where you have regions of stability and instability as the, these two parameters, Q and A, vary. Okay, so there's this very intricate spectrum, if you like, from the Matthew equation. I can actually rewrite this in quantum mechanics language. I'll divide by Q and call it 1 over h bar squared, and A over Q will be like an energy. Okay, so I can rewrite it as a Schrodinger equation, but of course I can also think of it as a quantum mechanical path integral. And now here's the spectrum, the energy U, as a function of coupling h bar. And you see that there are, unfortunately it doesn't show up very well, this should be, these should be shaded, these regions, okay. Um, so there are these so-called bands and gaps in the spectrum corresponding to these stability and instability regions here. I've just rescaled everything. Now I could give an entire talk on just this picture, so let me point out a few things. This mysterious n here doesn't appear in the equation. In the equation, there's an h-bar and there's an energy. n is a monodromy parameter. It comes from the boundary conditions you impose on the solutions, and it corresponds to these bands. The blue is the bottom of the band, the red dash one is the top of the band, and they're separated by gaps. And you'll see that the spectrum is actually labeled not just by h-bar, but also by n. N is some integer labeling the band, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. These dashed lines here are the top and bottom of the potential, 1 and minus 1, the cosine potential. And so from physics, we know, from solid state physics, we know that this is some model of a crystal. So if you're near the bottom of the potential, down here, it's as if you're just solving a harmonic oscillator problem and you just have discrete levels. Okay, but because of all the other potentials and the tunneling, they're actually widened into bands, which are exponentially narrow near the bottom of the well. But as you go up towards the top of the well, they're broadened into wider bands. Okay. If your energy is way above the top of the potential, very high up, then the potential is essentially irrelevant. So it's essentially a free particle but it's still periodic, so the energies, you have these narrow gaps, and they go like n squared, because it's a periodic problem. And so in physics, we learn how to calculate the exponentially small splitting, and that's what I would call non-perturbative semi-classical physics, a so one instanton approximation. But you see that as you approach this what's going to be an honest phase transition here at the top of the barrier, that one instanton approximation is hopeless, and you need to sum all of these non-perturbative effects to get the broadening of the band, and go into a region where the bands are broad and the gaps are now very narrow. One thing we've learnt from resurgence is that the formal series that you just do by getting, get by just doing perturbation theory in this well, for example, for the nth level in this well, you get a formal series in h-bar for each n. Those series, of course, are divergent. They develop into a trans series using resurgence. And we've learned that, in fact, that formal series encodes all the information about all orders of the trans series. It's really remarkable. And it's something that could have been done 100 years ago, but nobody even thought of doing this calculation. But, but if you look at the problem through the eyes of resurgence, it's an obvious calculation to do. So now let me talk about this as a phase transition. If, if you now look near the top of the potential, 
You'll notice, unfortunately, this is really not showing up very well. This is a band, this is a band, this is a gap. You'll notice here that the width of this band is equal to the width of that gap. And the width of that band is equal to the width of that gap. As you make the transition, the bands have broadened, and if you're coming from above, the gaps have broadened, and at the transition point, they're equal. Okay? And it's a, it's a real phase transition, and the parameter that's driving the phase transition is what physicists call a Tuft coupling. It's not h-bar, it's not n, it's n times h-bar, which is the classical action. And that's of order 1 at the top here. It's in fact 8 over pi in the, this normalization. And it's a transition from the physics of isolated atoms in a crystal, where they're separate. So these are narrow bands. So that's called the tight binding model in solid state physics. It's a transition to the free electron model, where you've got conduction electrons flowing in a crystal. Okay? So even the language we use to describe the physics here and here is completely different. And correspondingly, the trans series that we use to describe the spectrum is completely different here and here. And it's interestingly different here also. And so one thing I want to be able to understand is how this trans series structure here, which is divergent, changes as you tune this Tuft parameter and these things are no longer exponentially small and you need to sum all instantons. And you now go into a new re regime where the physics is completely different, your language is completely different, the expressions are completely different. And even the expressions here are divergent series, the expressions up here are convergent series. Okay, so how does that happen? How does a divergent trans series turn into a convergent expansion as you vary this Tuft parameter? And the physics of this is that this phase transition is, is driven by what we call instanton con condensation, where the one instanton approximation is no good. You have to think of a gas of instantons condensing. The other thing that's very interesting, there's this beautiful old, very short paper in the solid state literature by, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name correctly, Dickney, maybe, that the way to compute these very narrow widths of gaps high up in the spectrum is to look at complex instantons. Because if you think in language of WKB, you would want the turning points when the energy is way above the potential, but there are obviously no real turning points there, but there are complex turning points. And if you find the classical solutions that interpolate between those complex turning points and evaluate the action, you get exactly the widths of these gaps. Okay? So you can also think of this transition as a transition from a dominant saddles that are real instantons to a region where the dominant saddles are complex instantons. Okay? And all of this can be worked out in complete detail in this simple model. Now this simple model is not so simple because actually there's an exact mapping of this to a famous n equals 2 supersymmetric quantum field theory. Nekrasov et al. and this is made very explicit in some nice work by Miranov et al. and many other people. So even though this may sound very simple because I'm just talking about a quantum mechanical model, there's actually some very interesting quantum field theory buried in this problem also. All right, so let me move on. Let me give you another example. And it's a pleasure to be talking about that, this here because this was Edward Brezin's PhD thesis. So he was a student of Itzikson. And in his thesis, he studied the transition from what is effectively real instantons to complex instantons in the problem of vacuum pair production. The vacuum is unstable to the application of an electric field because the electric field can accelerate apart electron-positron pairs and create real electrons and positrons. And if you do this problem with a time-dependent electric field with one frequency, omega, it's an extremely interesting WKB problem and you get an expression for the rate of this pair production, which looks exponentially small. And it has some prefactor involving the electric field, the mass of the electron, the speed of light, E, h-bar, these fundamental constants. 
And some function, which is some octan or something, I can't even remember what it is, but it's some explicit trigonometric function of this adiabaticity parameter, which basically tells you if gamma is large, it's a very rapidly varying field, and if gamma is small, it's a roughly constant field. So there's a very interesting transition. This function here goes to 1 when gamma goes to 0, and you just get this exponentially small thing, which looks like this sort of one instanton approximation here. Whereas if you go to the other limit, where this thing's rapidly oscillating, it develops a logarithmic behavior. And what you thought was exponentially small is, in fact, a power. So it's actually a power of the perturbation, epsilon. And that's the perturbative limit. And this one expression interpolates between these. This, is, this was what Brezant did in his PhD thesis, building on earlier work of Keldish in the world of ionization. And this expression is extremely interesting because from the exponent here, the power, we recognize this as the number of photons for doing this pair production because this, the barrier to production is 2mc squared. That's the rest mass energy of the electron-positron pair. It's 4 because it's a probability, so we've squared it. And it's that divided by the photon energy. So that's the number of photons <laughs> needed to not tunnel but to go over the barrier, okay? So this is a, also a phase transition between this non-perturbative type expression to a perturbative expression as tunneling versus multi-photon ionization or pair production in this case. Extremely beautiful calculation. And this can be interpreted also in the language of this transition from real to complex saddles and instantons. So this is now more complicated than the quantum mechanics problem because this is real quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics. But it's still not quite full quantum field theory, so let me go to a more complicated system. So this is the essentially a relativistic cousin of the example that Marcos talked about the other day in his beautiful talk about these uh, superconducting systems. This is a famous model in quantum field theory due to David Gross and André Neveu from the mid-1970s when they were struggling to understand what asymptotic freedom meant in QCD. So asymptotic freedom is this weird property that it, in certain th systems, the strength of the interaction actually gets weaker as things get closer together, which is completely counterintuitive if you think about it. And this simple model of two-dimensional quantum field theory with a four fermion interaction has the property of being asymptotically free, having dynamical mass generation and chiral symmetry. So it, it's a very nice model that captures some of the features of QCD while being much simpler to analyze than QCD. It has a chiral symmetry breaking phase transition in the large number of flavors, number of fermions limit. And the physics of it is a relativistic version of something that's also well known in the condensed matter literature called a piles instability. That in one dimensions, with these four fermion interactions, things tend to clump and dimerize and form kink anti kink crystals. So the phase diagram of this could be studied at finite temperature and finite density. Think back to that problem I mentioned at the beginning of the QCD phase diagram. This is a baby version of that problem. And in this case, you can actually solve it in detail. Now, unfortunately, people first solved it in detail but got the wrong answer. So in textbooks and review articles, there's this phase diagram, which is actually completely incorrect. The true phase diagram is the thing on the right. That, in fact, as a function of temperature and chemical potential, think of that roughly as a measure of density, there's a region where you develop crystals, so periodic structures in space. And as you vary temperature and chemical potential, you can go from a phase where this M is a, the expectation value of psi bar psi is either zero, a non-zero constant, or an X-dependent crystal. And the breakthrough in this came from work by Michel Thies, who solved this problem using hutri fock originally numerically and then analytically. And then later, it was understood in the language of saddles solving this so-called gap equation, which is the sort of saddle equation in these fermionic systems. So this is a very, very tricky computation. You have to choose some, here's a Dirac operator with some potential, 
sigma of x, that's the e expectation value of psi bar psi, you have to evaluate these determinants such that the variation with respect to sigma is equal to sigma. Okay, so extremely nonlinear, non-trivial problem. And you need to solve this problem at finite temperature and finite density. Okay, fortunately, it can be done by some magic. This is an integrable model. So you can think of the thermodynamic potential, the, the, the partition function, roughly speaking. It's some integral over the um, density of states with this Fermi factor. And the ginzburg landau expansion says you expand this in powers and powers of derivatives of this condensate field, sigma. There's this gap that uh, Markos was talking about. So it turns out there's an amazing, well, maybe not amazing, th there's a useful relation between this ginzburg landau expansion and the MKDV hierarchy. Turns out these quantities here, when you expand this, are exactly the conserved quantities of the MKDV hier hierarchy. You can now use all the machinery of, of uh, these integrable systems to actually solve this gap equation at any temperature and any chemical potential. And so here's an illustration of what happens if you were only able to do that to a certain number of orders of this expansion, because this ginzburg landau expansion itself is divergent expansion. So if you just go to the first non-trivial order, you get a, a crystal phase in, shown in red. If you go to the next order, it's like this. The next order, it's like this. This is in the vicinity of this tricritical point. So you see this little wedge here? So Joe, yes. can, can you take this F of M as a conserved, some, some type of conserved charges? Yes, yes. They are exactly the conserved charges. So this is a divergent expansion and you fill out this full uh, crystal region as you go to higher and higher orders of this expansion. And you see from this picture already, unfortunately this is not showing up very well, this phase transition point here where you go from this massive phase, homogeneous phase to a crystal, this point is the most difficult point to access using this ginzburg landau expansion. So now you can go and look at the sort of standard ways of doing this calculation, a low density expansion, a high density expansion. And if we look for simplicity on the zero temperature axis, you see that the high density expansion, rho is the density, is a nice convergent series. The low density expansion, it's convergent because there are only two terms. But it turns out that there are exponentially small terms that are not, you don't see them in the normal low density expansion. But since we have the full solution, we can see that those terms are there. And the appearance of these terms are what is responsible for this phase transition here. So this is an extremely non-trivial, extremely is maybe extreme. It's a non-trivial quantum field theory. It's integrable, so it's not extremely non-trivial. But it's an honest, interesting, quantum field theory in which we can see some very interesting phase transition behavior triggered by some trans-series structure in something that we usually just calculate using perturbation theory. There are many other models. I'm going to have to zip through some of these. Just uh, let me flash them. 2D Yang-Mills is a famous example that's very much like the, the matrix models examples that we've heard about in several talks. This has two ways of doing the calculation of the partition function. So there are two parameters. One is the area of the sphere, and one is the n of the un or sun or what, whatever you want to do, the gauge group. You can either think of it in the Hamiltonian language as a sum over the spectrum. So this is sum over representations, and this is the Casimir. Or you can think of it as a saddle expansion, the sum over <coughs> saddles of the partition function, their monopoles. And that gives you a different type of expansion. And you notice that this one has A over N and this has N over A. And the relation between them is exactly a Poisson duality transformation between them. And the phase transition, the third order phase transition discovered by Douglas and Kazakoff, is exactly at the sort of self-dual point where the critical area is pi squared in this normalization. So this type of transition happens in many, many systems. This is a particularly well-studied and elegant uh, model. But 
it's representative of many other uh, such transitions. <coughs> it's impossible to talk about phase transitions without mentioning the Ising model. It's sort of the most studied phase transition in all of physics. So the two-dimensional Ising model has a well-known kramers vernier duality relating high temperature and low temperature. It has a phase transition at some critical temperature somewhere in between, zero and infinity. And the expansions around zero temperature and around infinite temperature are actually related to one another because of this duality, but they're both convergent. So one of the points I want to make is that even in systems where there's convergence of expansions, you can still use some of the ideas of resurgence. For example, if you expand around zero temperature, just learning the radius of convergence of that tells you the critical temperature. So you've learned something. If you now look at the large order behavior of those convergent coefficients around zero, you learn the nature of that phase transition. You learn that it's logarithmic. The fact that there's this duality means you can do the same thing starting at infinite temperature. And you do that and you learn that it's not just log of t minus tc, it's log of the modulus of t minus tc. Okay? So even in a situation like this where the expansions are convergent, you can use some of these ideas of relating expansions in one region to determine information about expansions in other regions. It's actually much deeper than that because we can now look at correlators between two spins on this Ising lattice. And if you go along the diagonal of a square Ising lattice, these correlators are tau functions for pen of A6. Pen of A6 with a special choice of parameters. There's an n here, which is the number of diagonal steps, so n is sort of an integer. Right? And the boundary conditions are actually special boundary conditions, so they're, they're what uh, Jean-Pierre would call non-generic. Right? These are very special, and that's what's responsible for this logarithmic type behavior in the, in the Ising system. These, these correlators have simple topless determinant representations in terms of hypergeometric functions, so for these special versions of Penelope 6, the problem actually linearizes. There's this very clever, you can think of it as a change of function, change of variables, which completely linearizes the problem. And that's not true in general, of course, in Penelope 6. You can study the scaling limit where this correlation length goes to infinity and you approach the critical temperature. It's a little bit like a Tuft limit. And that was the big discovery back in the 60s of McCoy and Wu and, and uh, Tracy and uh, Baruch, that in doing so, the pen of A6 reduces to pen of A3. I also want to make the point that these expansions here have convergent conformal block expansions at both high and low temperature. And this was first pointed out by Jimbo back in the early 70s. And recently there's been a lot of activity from the field theory side showing that these, there are these explicit conformal block expansions of tau functions. And I want to just point out that this is an expression of resurgence. Because the expression for the tau function is an instanton sum. Again, this is along the lines of what Ricardo talked about the other day. It's not just instantons, it's also anti-instantons. So it's a sum from minus infinity to infinity. This is the instanton counting trans-series parameter. And there are some coefficients which are explicitly expressed in terms of Barnes functions. And then there are the temperature, depend temperature variable dependent stuff, which is expressed as sums over young tableau, young diagrams. Think of it as sums over partitions. And the key property is that there's a prefactor t to the sigma squared, and sigma is the other trans-series parameter. So there are two trans-series parameters because it's a second order problem. And this is quadratic in sigma. That's the key feature. And why is that important? Because this instanton sum says that in the different instanton sectors, all you have to do is shift sigma by n. So this is the origin of that n squared type behavior that Ricardo was talking about the other day. <coughs> 
And it just comes from this conformal block expansion. And so for Penderbase 6, there's a completely explicit expression, combinatorial expression for all the coefficients in this expansion. And by reduction, you can do the same thing for any Penderbase system. Okay? So this is. Yes. Sorry, two quick questions. What, yes. what is S physically? S, it, e to the i theta. <coughs> it's, a, it's an instanton counting parameter but counting instantons and anti-instantons. So, th you know, there are details here. I have to talk about which lines I'm talking on f about for this to make sense. So I don't want to go into that and level. Is there a simple way to see why or the origin of this conformal block expansion? Yeah, but I, I don't have time to talk about it now. I can tell you about it later. Okay? I just want to make the point that this is by now very well understood in Penave world, but it's an explicit expression of resurgence because it says that all you need to know is this thing, this expressions, when n equals zero, and then any instanton number, you just shift sigma by n. Okay, completely explicit expressions. This is very, very beautiful work, of essentially upgrading this idea of Jimbo to all orders. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna have to skip through this stuff very quickly. So there's another example along these lines where you can do things in complete detail. There's a famous matrix model called the gross witten wadier unitary matrix model. It's integral over unitary n by n matrices with a coupling 1 over g squared. It has this uh, third order phase transition just like in the 2D Yang-Mills on a sphere. This is driven by pain level 3 at finite n and pain level 2 at the, the double scaling limit near the transition. And this transition, this double scaling limit is this tracy widom transition which occurs in, I don't know, I could make a list of 15 different problems where this is the transition. And the reason it's so universal is that it's the nonlinear version of the single turning point transition in, in quantum mechanics which is described by the Airy function. This is basically the nonlinear Airy function. And so this is why it shows up in all these problems. This also has this uh, Toplitz determinant representation. As n goes to infinity, what Gross and Witten pointed out was that there was a kink in the specific heat. That's a signal of the phase transition. But I think I'm going to have to skip through all of this quickly. You can map it exactly to a pain levé. Three guy. You can check in weak coupling. There's a large n expansion, the formal one of n expansion has exponential corrections, so there's a full trans series here. You can check that the low order behavior, sorry, the high order behavior of these perturbative coefficients for any t has this characteristic low order, high order expansion in terms of the action with coefficients that show up in the expansion of these guys. All of the expected parametric resurgence expressions are completely explicit. They, they work out as we expect them. On the strong coupling side, even though everything is completely convergent, when you go to this strong this uh, tuft limit, they become divergent expansions. But again, they have the correct large order, low order relations. You can calculate the Li Yang zeros since the expression for the partition function is just a determinant of Bessel functions at finite n, at finite n you can just find the complex zeros, it's not difficult. The expectation is that they form some sort of region like this. When you zoom in on the transition point, which is where it's pinching the real axis here at 1, this is t instead of xi, you can look now at the complex zeros of the Penleve 2 hastings mcleod solution, which form like this. And so this wedge here is just that wedge there zoomed in at large n. Okay, so you can make all of these ideas extremely explicit in this case because you have total control over finite n as well as infinite n. It's a particularly beautiful model. Okay, I could go on and on and on about different examples of phase transitions that we do understand. But I want to switch to a slightly different tack just in the last 20 minutes. I'm going to actually make a bit of a reality check here. 
and this is recent and ongoing work with the video Kosten, which is that doing these calculations is really difficult. And I, I want to talk now about a really difficult problem, not one of these nice integral problems where, you know, a lot of structure. Just think of some really difficult problem, such as QCD, Yang-Mills, Hubbard model, something, you know, that we're not going to be able to solve completely. Can we use resurgence to still do something useful? So, in physics, this means, can we extrapolate from finite information to something realistic? In mathematics, so that may sound to the mathematicians like a kind of boring problem, but I, I want to convince you at the end that there's a lot of very beautiful mathematics here involving all of these guys. And today, I only have time to show you some explicit numerical, if you like, experiments, but I think they'll convince you that something interesting is going on, and in current and ongoing work, we have actual theorems that can tell you that if you give me n terms of an expansion of something, we can now tell you what degree of precision you can hope to get in this region of the parameter space. Real, complex, wherever. Okay? So these are very strong results that don't exist at the moment, and they the the route to these results explicitly uses resurgence. But let me not state theorems, let me show you some experiments. So again, it's motivated by this sort of stuff. Imagine you only had a little bit of information here. What could you possibly learn about the middle? Okay, so resurgence suggests that some sort of local analysis like this is supposed to encode global information. So the question is how much global information? And the reason you might think that this could be successful is that if you work in the Borel plane and if what you're calculating is actually a resurgent function, which we usually expect in physics context, the, these set of natural problems, then it tells you that in the Borel plane there should be some orderly structure. Okay? You don't, in advance you don't know how orderly, but it's not going to be totally random and a mess. So now, can you develop extrapolation techniques that take advantage of that? And I'm going to illustrate it with Penave 1, because I think everybody in the room is familiar with Penave, so you can relate to it. But also because Penave 1 is interesting for physics, so that's another reason. But the main reason is that we can do extreme precision tests, because we know everything about Penave 1 analytically. Okay, so let's start. Here's Penave 1. You make a formal expansion at large x, and you see already from the balance of this that there's a square root of x over 6. I'm going to choose the minus sign for a special reason, and then it's a simple matter to generate these coefficients, and this is what the first few of them look like. Okay? And this expansion explicitly develops the tree truncate solution to P1, and I'm picking the tree truncate because in some sense the tree truncate is the most difficult, because it's the most finely tuned. You can also do this for Tronke and the general solution, but that's less interesting. This is the biggest challenge here. Okay, so the question is, if I take how many, co if I take some number of these coefficients, and these coefficients are just developed out here at x equals infinity, how much do those coefficients know about the rest of the complex x plane? Okay. So a video jokes that one coefficient is not enough, a thousand of coefficients is too many, it's somewhere in between. Right? So how many do we need? So again, as Ricardo pointed out the other day, there's this inherent five-fold symmetry of the equation, but I'm just going to start with data that was developed out here, and I'm going to ask, do those coefficients know about the global structure of this solution? And how much do they know? Okay. And of course, there are these phase transition Stokes and anti-Stokes lines that are the, the most interesting points. So if you look at the plots on the digital library, unfortunately, they use the opposite convention of X, so it's flipped. But it's as if we're trying to come in on this separatrix and then go off into the rest of the complex plane. You know, it's exponentially sensitive to the boundary conditions. So let's start. 
first of all, no big surprise, the coefficients are factorially divergent. Okay, fine. So we make a Borel transform. Fine. If we had, this is convergent, has radius convergence 1 in my normalization. So if we knew this function, if we really knew what that function was, we could just write this integral representation of the original solution. Okay? But we don't know this function. We only know something about that function. So if I only have a certain number of coefficients, what can I do in the Borel plane which gives me a well-behaved Borel of P which somehow captures global information? That's the challenge. So I truncate this expansion because I can only calculate some certain number of these coefficients. So the first obvious step to do is to make a Pade approximate for this. Okay, it's a finite order polynomial. You make it into a Pade, one of these almost diagonal Pades, because there's this sort of odd power here that's not important. This is completely algorithmic. You can just press a button on Math Mathematica or Maple, it'll generate the Pade for you. It's zero work. And then the zeros of, of P and Q tell you some information, some global information about this function B of P. So, for example, you can look at the poles and you see these pictures similar to what we've seen already in the conference. These poles are trying to represent a cut, whatever that means. Okay? Since you're in Pade world, there can only be poles. You're working with polynomials. There are some results in the literature about how Pade tries to represent cuts. Looking at the density of these, the distribution of these poles, you can actually learn information about what type of cut it is. That's actually extremely difficult, it turns out. There's a much easier way to do it. But at least looking at this, we've, it looks like branch points from plus or minus i. Now, this step already is fantastic. If you take the raw, this is with n equal 10, 10 terms. If you take the raw per day from out to infinity down towards zero, this is what you would get. If you apply a per day to it, this is what you would get. And this dashed line here is the exact answer starting at zero. So you go all the way down to you know, 0 0.2, 0.25. And this is from 10 terms where you press the button once. It's not difficult. Okay, so this is fantastic. But we can do much better. The much better is a magic step that physicists knew about in various contexts long ago, but I claim that the reason it works is because of resurgence. So you make a <coughs> conformal map to bring these, the, this doubly cut plane here into this unit disk. And the reason this is important is because actually this is not just one cut. This is actually many cuts, if you believe that it's a resurgent problem. But there are, and they're layered on top of one another. And you can't see that here. You can't see it easily. So these repeated cuts here should map, well, map under this conformal map to here, here, here. Okay? So now you just do something also algorithmic and trivial. You map the finite Borel transform into the conformal disk. You re-expand and re-pad that. Totally algorithmic. And now you look for the poles there. And this is what you get. The leading one, the subleading one, the next one, the next one. So you've suddenly discovered the resurgent structure just by making a conformal map. Okay? Also, extremely simple step, easy to implement. And it has this feature that it separates these poles into the separate resurgent branch points. Okay? There is the poles outside of this disk are higher Riemann surface contributions because, of course, this thing must be convergent inside the disk, so there can't be poles inside the disk. So there's also resurgent information buried in them, but I'm not going to talk about it today. I just want to make the point that this conformal map reveals the resurgent structure in an, in an instant. So we can now take advantage of that by working with these conformal map pardes 
And we find that we get now much, much, much higher precision. And at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll explain why, where that's coming from. But I stress that physicists already knew this, or they knew that making this conformal map was somehow better, but I don't think it was appreciated why and how much better. Yeah. The locations of the poles are known? Uh, they're, they're exactly these. Yeah, but uh, they are analytically known? Oh, yeah, of course. So if you map back, you see in the, in the original p-plane, you see now the resurgent structure. So just a simple test, you can now use that version of the Borel transform. And you get this solid blue line compared to what you get if, use, if you use Pade Borel. And you see you get better precision down to lower values of x on the real axis. Okay? But now let's do some more precision tests. Let's look for resurgence. So we know that the leading singularity is at plus or minus i. And the coefficient, and we know that it's a square root branch cap. We can test that in many, many ways. So you can ask, what's the coefficient? And that coefficient should be the Stokes constant. And for Penlevé A1, we know the Stokes constant. So here I can plot when n equals 10, right? 10 coefficients only the approach to this critical point. So this is the Borel plane P. So I'm going to approach this critical point here. And this dotted line is the Stokes constant for Pen of A1. And the red line is if you used the Pade Borel. And you see it's approaching fairly well. You know, this is 0.96 here. But it breaks down as you approach the the branch point. Whereas the black line is the conformally mapped guy and it approaches the Stokes constant perfectly. Okay. So I can get five digits of precision with 10 input terms approaching <laughs> this leading singularity. Okay. Whereas with Pade Borel, you can't even get one digit of precision from that. I can now do, right, so Along this direction, where you do your Borel integral, if x is real and positive, everything's fine. But if you want to rotate x in the complex plane, you have to be able to rotate p in the complex plane. And the most interesting, difficult point is going to be as you approach this, these lines of cuts. Okay? So now I'm going to skim along this cut. And if we do it with the Pade Borel, as you approach the first singularity, it's diverging as it should, but it's not diverging well. It's missing as you get very close. And then when you go beyond that first one, you just get garbage. Right? Just <laughs> hopeless. Okay? And there's no sign whatsoever of the further singularities. Now with the conformally mapped guy, I can skim perfectly smoothly along this cut. You see the first one. You see the second one. If you zoom in here, you see the third one. So let me zoom in on the, the second one. So this would be the second singularity here. There's a jump there. And resurgence tells you that the coefficient of that jump, the size of that jump, should be a half the Stokes constant squared, which is this, which it is. Okay? So you can even do high precision probing of not just the leading singularity, but the subleading singularity, etc. And that's why you can get such incredible precision with this guy, which you can't get with this guy, okay? In some parts of the complex x-plane. Okay, so we can also zoom in from infinity down to some point and repade, that's another option. And in order to do that, you need very high precision values for the function and its first derivative here, but that's exactly what this method gives you. It gives you almost absurd precision. So now let's do some diagnostics. Let's test this. And we can test Penlevé 1 to very high precision because we know everything. So let's go from infinity down to zero. It's a central connection problem. There's no closed solution for this in Penlevé 1. And it's one of the standard test cases that numerical analysis people do. And the very best numerical analysis people get 14 digits of precision. 
Okay. So with this method, starting with 50 terms at infinity, we get 64 digits of precision. Okay. So you can calculate y, y prime, y double prime at zero, and it's zero to 65 digits. Okay. Starting with just 50 terms. If I start with 10 terms, I get you know 20 something digits of precision. And the very best numerical analysis people get 14. So why is this happening? Well, now I can go beyond, uh, this is the x plane. So coming from infinity, I just went down to zero, but I can keep going. I can go to negative x. And we see the poles on the negative x axis. Just, it's just plot. So now we can go into the complex plane and just wander through the complex plane. And we know that as we cross these Stokes lines and anti-Stokes lines, there are transitions. Exponential things are going to appear and disappear and come in. So how much of this global information is encoded in this input data, which just came from here? Okay. So again, recall this five-fold structure. We're going to go this, this, and eventually into here. So there's connection formulas from the work of Kitaev and this beautiful paper of Stavros and company that relates the behavior of the function, say, along this line to the behavior of the function along this line. It's a very precise relation that this difference here behaves like this. So here's the real part of this difference, and I don't know which is which. The blue one is this, and the red one is this at large x. So you see they agree very well. Okay? This is just with, I think this plot was with 50 terms. Okay. Now we can look at connecting Stokes lines. So we can connect this Stokes line with this Stokes line. And the difference between these two with a particular phase is exponentially decaying with a prefactor depending on the Stokes constant. And again, Perfect agreement at large x. Okay. Remember, this is coming from a finite amount of information here. And we're talking now about the most difficult directions in the complex x-plane. And with just a certain number of terms here, we can map out all of this complicated um, analytic continuation properties of this Penave solution. So it really is true that these, this expansion is encoding, in some clever way, this global information. So we can now go into the pole region. So there's this conjecture of, of Dubrovin. So the old work of Boutrou was that at large distances, the poles look like the poles of the Weierstrass function, suitably scaled. For the Triton K, these poles only appear in this 2 pi over 5 wedge. For the other ones, they can leak outside, depending on the, on the, Stoke, on the um, trans series parameter. But for the tree trunk A, they're only in this wedge. So here they are from our extrapolated solution. The blue dots are we're starting with 10 terms. The red dots are starting with 50 terms. Okay, they form this beautiful lattice. You can use old work of Ovidio using this trans asymptotics where you resum the instantons. And we can use this to make a prediction for the location of these poles as you cross into the Triton K region. You just insert this Stokes constant for C. And this is the agreement. I plot it for the first line of poles. So this is also very much like what uh, Ricardo was showing. As you go into this region, these trans series out here turn into things that look uh, better described by meromorphic functions with poles. And the locations of these poles are perfectly captured by this extrapolation. The Penelope equation tells you that the expansion around any pole looks like this. There's a second order pole with residue one. There's <coughs> one more constant, the other boundary condition parameter. So we can just test our solution, expand it around this first pole and see how well it satisfies this structure. And the answer is every coefficient there matches to 30 digits. In the 
So in fact, there's no real sense to describing what happens in Penave 1 at x equals 0 because x equals 0 is not special. But at the first pole, it is special. And so now we have high precision values for the location of the first pole and for the first constant about the first pole, which has a spectral interpretation in terms of the cubic oscillator. Okay, so I'm, I'm over time already, so let me quickly flash two other examples that you can study. So here's a problem from quantum field theory, the cusp anomalous dimension. So you can start at strong coupling, which is a divergent expansion. You can start at weak coupling, which is a convergent expansion. And these black dots are what you get from applying this uh, mapping. And you see it interpolates perfectly well between the two limits. Since Sergey is here, I'm going to show a few pictures related to his beautiful work on complex transcendence theory. So one of the examples in their paper, if you do Pade Borel, you, you generate this cut-like thing. If you do this, and it's, you know, you have to do some fancy stuff that takes advantage of the special structure of the problem to recognize that this is actually a sequence of poles. If you just uh, make a conformal map of this, it again breaks up into the images of these uh, poles. So you see the resurgence structure immediately simply by making the conformal map. You can then plot along that axis, along this, and the, let's see, I'm plotting the real part of that here, and the blue lines is the conformally mapped guy, and the red line is what if you would get if you use Pade Borel. And you, so you see for the first singularity, they're pretty much the same, but the Pade Borel degrades as you go to the higher singularities, which th means that if you wanted to do some analytic continuation in the physical variable, you would need a well-behaved uh, Borel transform near these singularities. And what this is showing is that the conformally mapped Borel transform is much better near the singularities. Okay, so let me conclude because I'm over. I'm not going to bother saying some of this. Let me just say a few words about why this is happening. So Pade is well known to involve three-term recursion relations as you change the order of the Pade. As soon as you hear the word three-term recursion relations, you should think of orthogonal <coughs> polynomials. As soon as you think of orthogonal polynomials and making the polynomials larger, you should think of zego asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials. And now the idea is that if you apply this mechanism, and in, in particular um, some results of Barry Simon and Damanik about characterizing the uh, asymptotics of these orthogonal polynomials, you can apply that in Borel world, in, in the Borel plane, to your representations of the Borel transform and you can get really precise estimates of the errors. Okay? So don't work in the physical domain, work in the Borel domain where there's more structure and using these <coughs> properties of continued fractions, etc. that's why you can actually develop estimates of how much precision you can get. So that'll be my next talk. So thank you. Yes, uh, two things. Um, yeah. If you do conformal mappings, yes. perhaps you could simply, uh, are, are, there, are there cases where you can actually perform the integration? Because yes. now the, the yes. Laplace transform is on, on a, on a yes. finite segment on which the yes. series converges, yes. and then. There, there are many options, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, 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 yeah. that is uh, useful also? Yes. Okay. But remember, where, where you go in the Borel variable, depends on where you want to be in the physical variable, right? Yeah. You rotate in the physical variable, that corresponds to some transformation in the Borel plane. So in certain cases, it might be better to work inside the conformal disk. In other cases, it might be better to go back to the p-plane. But you have both options. I have a question. So if we look at uh, the tree truncate of pine level one, you wrote down the first Stokes constant that you know can be numerically approximated very well and, mm -hmm. and, and then recognized. Yeah. Is there an <coughs> formula for that Stokes constant 
of course. So, if, yeah, it's square root of three. No, 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 no. That mean? was the recognition. Yeah. No, no, I mean, uh, you mean in this method? The entire talk about how to numerically compute and then maybe. Oh, no, the Stokes constant for P1 is known from isomonodromic deformation, but also from asymptotics. Not from isomonodromic. Is there a formula for the Stokes constant that one can a priori. From asymptotics? Yes. So Ovidu did this. Right, you come at it from both directions and you apply single validness and you get it immediately. This is in his, I, I don't remember which paper, but uh, so either asymptotics or isomonodromy, you get the closed form Stokes constant. Yeah. With this method, you can get it to 100 digits. And you either recognize it and work with it or you are happy with 100 digits precision and you just use it, okay? So... And what prevents you to get all the Stokes constants that Ricardo was looking for? Um, if you want them numerically, nothing. No, 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 no exactly, oh. because oh. Okay. you said there is an exact <coughs> formula for getting them. For getting the, the Stokes constant. There's one Stokes constant mm -hmm. in this, no, in the tree truncate. You gave two examples of magical conformal transformation, but you didn't explain how to find it and the reason. So the re yeah, I, I, sorry, I ran out of time. So, so the, okay, <laughs> so le let me tell you the secret. So, so, so in this Pade transformation, so Pade turns something into a ratio of polynomials, right? But you can represent that in more efficient ways. You can write it as a partial fraction representation, in which case you have the poles and the residues. Turns out that's even better than Pade, but you can do something even better, which you can convert it to a continued fraction. Now, it doesn't sound much better because they're the same thing, but it turns out to be much more numerically stable. And now when you study the large n limit of continued fractions, there's something called a terminant. You can actually choose how to terminate. Right? And as soon as you do that, you study the large order behavior of the um, three-term recursion relations that come up from the continued fraction representation, you discover the conformal map. It's the limit point of that large n behavior. Okay. So that's, what it, that's the deep reason of why these conformal maps are the right thing to do. Are you guaranteed that there is convergence? No, but that's what Simon and Damanik showed. They have an if and only if condition on the behavior of the continued fraction coefficients that guarantee you that you have a well-defined measure that defines a set of orthogonal polynomials. Very beautiful result. Okay, I, I think. Yeah, no, just some remarks. Should be, I thought about a long time ago, should be some software just draw by your mouse the path, maybe yes. something, uh, and some videos of the past, and then should be formal how to change conform an embedded disk. Yeah. And then make inverse map and try to understand it. Yeah, so, so there, there are, there are. I haven't done it yet, but there, are, I, I've, tra I've tracked down the material, which is these numerical generations of conformal maps. Yeah. It's very efficient, yeah. but it can clearly be applied to this problem. Yes. Yes. And another question, just to the very beginning of the talk, with these large n problems, yeah. do you have any idea of what are large symbols where they are? Um, It's not the one space in sensitivity. Yeah, no, I don't know where they live. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the matrix models, yes. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, how many coefficients? So you mentioned that you would, that the goal is to try to apply this to QCD and Yang Mills and stuff like that. How many coefficients do we have right now for. Because here you'd use yeah. like 10 so or 50 coefficients. So I have a drawer in my office full of examples, and Sergey's going to give me a few more to put in there. Um, so, you know, G minus 2 in QED is the, the sort of most famous calculation in quantum field theory. There are five coefficients, okay? There are certain quantities in QCD where people have calculated 35 coefficients. A typical number is more like 10 or 15. In statistical physics, very often there are calculations that might have 30 terms. There are of course, some... Do you have an idea of what the conformal transformation is supposed to be in that case? Um, in general, no, but 
Once you find the branch cut, I can tell you that the, the, behave, the dependence on n goes like e to the minus square root of n times x, where x is your large parameter. So e to the minus square root. Okay, so that gives you some idea that as you increase n, you're going to get exponential increase. But, you know, we take what we can get. I mean, I can't tell QCD people to calculate 100 coefficients. <laughs> in, 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 in <laughs> but the, p the, the message is that something of, order of the order 10 contains useful information. If that wasn't true, if you needed 1,000, then forget it. Okay? But we have several examples now that tell you that of, of the order of 10, you may be able to learn something interesting. <coughs> but then can you try to do the calculation and see how it compares with the experiment? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> this is all very new. Yeah. Uh, yes, about your Matthew equation plot. May yes. I just also suggest that the alternative is to use 1 over h bar uh, on the, ex yeah. on the horizontal axis. Yeah, I mean, and I just uh, like to see what it looks like. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's like the first plot that I showed. Yeah. I was just showing it like an energy spectrum. So.